Well, hello, everyone. Um, what a fun program we have in store for you today uh, to start your Thanksgiving week. I am Miles K. Glancy. I am the general manager of Philharmonia Baroque Orchestra and Chorale. And I'd like to welcome all of our 2020 virtual members to our second virtual PBO Sessions at Home event entitled Give Me the Moonlight, Decisions, Decisions, hosted by none other than music director Richard Egar himself. Uh, before we, we begin this event, I want to remind all of you that tomorrow evening, Chamber Music returns to PBO in the premiere of Bach, The Unanswered Question, recorded at Herbst Theater last month and streamed tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. Pacific on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. More information is on our website at philharmonia.org. Now, during this event, you do have a choice whether or not to make yourself visible uh, by turning your video feed on or off. You can do this by pressing start video or stop video on the bottom of your screen. Your microphones will be muted throughout the event, but you will have an opportunity to ask questions at the end live during our Q&A if you'd like. In order to toggle with your view settings to optimize your experience with us today, since we're in Zoom standard and you might see a lot more people in on your Zoom window than, before, than uh, with webinar, if you're using a computer, you can go to the top right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, you, it should say view. And there you can toggle between gallery view or speaker view, whichever you prefer. If you'd like to type questions to Richard, please feel free to utilize the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. You may submit questions at any time and we'll try and get to any questions uh, you have at the end. Uh, as always, if you have any issues, you can email info at philharmonia.org or use the chat feature. And I'd now like to introduce our ever lovely music director, Richard Egar. Thank you, Miles. What a lovely introduction. Welcome. It's a, it's a beautiful winter evening here in Amsterdam. It got dark about three and a half hours ago, so the nights are drawing in. I'm uh, in my kitchen, as, as, as you've seen me before, in front of uh, the play out piano, which you perhaps saw when we did the Beethoven 5 and 6, particularly for this is a week in class trip. Um, sessions are usually associated with um, a live concert of some sort. This isn't. This, I just wanted to, to, to do something to maybe give you a, an insight into the kinds of problems, questions that face us as historically informed performers. And I was sort of searching for a piece that might be a good way to do that. And I thought something which would be very, very well known and, um, and popular would be a good piece. And it just came to me a couple of weeks ago that the Moonlight Sonata is probably a piece that anybody who's ever played the piano will have played. It's not a, it's an incredibly famous piece. It was very famous as soon, pretty much as soon as it was written, um, within, within 10 or 15 years, it, it had already acquired this, this um, mystique about it. Uh, and it's, um, it's a beautiful piece of music and it's not difficult for anybody to play, anybody that has had any piano lessons. So I thought it would be a great opportunity, we're seeing as we're still in the Beethoven year, to, to look at this piece and show you some of the things which should go through our minds as performers, investigative, investigative I can't say that, investigative performers for this piece and, and the sort of process that one goes through for for any, any piece of, of music, really, but to give you an idea how this historically informed world should work. So, um, as I say, it's the most, probably one of the most popular pieces of piano music ever written, maybe Claire de Lune is a close second. And popularity doesn't always breed uh, good things, perhaps. So I thought I'd just start up, start up by giving you a little blast of what the uh, first movement of Moonlight Sonata has morphed into. And uh, here's a little blast of a video of the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata.
grass, that's, that's probably enough of that. I mean, that's, um, I don't think that's got a lot to do with Beethoven's conception of the moonlight as not a first group. Uh, it's certainly selling something, that's for sure. Um, the fact that, that the, the last thing you heard from the cello, the is not actually the tune, it doesn't stop it, it's just literally. Anyway, that's one little quibble. I, I'm sure we can find some others. Um, but that's, this is what can happen to very, very famous pieces of music. They can get abused uh, or not in, a, in, in this, this kind of way. Um, uh, but let's move on from that. I think that's, that's enough of, of that little exposure. Uh, what about the music itself? When was it written? Why was it written? <laughs> we know that this, this music, the, the piece was written in around 1801. Um, and uh, one of the stories around it is that it was associated with uh, a lady called Julie Giuciardi. There she is. She was known as a great beauty um, when she came to Vienna in 1799, 1800. She was immediately sort of snapped up by society because of her beauty. And Beethoven came into contact with, with her late in 1801 as a student. Uh, and we know from reports later on by uh, Anton Schindler, who I'll come back to later, that he was deeply, deeply obsessed with her. And he admitted that he was in love with her. This was much later on in the 1820s. There were some theories that she was the famous immortal beloved uh, that, that sort of broke his heart, and, and uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. But if we look at the, um, the, the evidence, that's probably not the case. Um, so this, this is when the music was written. It was written around 1801 when this lady was studying with Beethoven. Um, we have, what are the sources for the music? We know this is, this is uh, and here we can see two, two plates. On the left, you can see the second page of the original manuscript of the sonata. The first page, unfortunately, doesn't survive, which is a bit of a pity, because that could sort of be a very, very interesting piece of manuscript to have. But as you can see on the left, this is the second page of manuscript. And for Beethoven, this is an unbelievably neat manuscript, if you're familiar with some Beethoven manuscripts, particularly, particularly the late manuscripts, they can be incredibly messy and lots of crossings out. Here is not so bad. Um, we have the rest of the, of the manuscript for this, but uh, that's an example of the second page of it. Uh, and it has some interesting things and some, some things which, which don't appear and some things which are crossed out, as you can see. And then the, that's the title page of the first edition. With you, as you can see, the dedication uh, of this sonata quasi una fantasia to this lady, Giulietta Giuciardi, um, which, which kind of gave rise to this idea that uh, it was written for her because he was infatuated. Actually, that's not the case. He, he had probably had a rondo in G in mind for her, but just the publication in, in August of 1802 he just slapped her name on it. He, he, he was wanted to dedicate something and he just put this, this um, title page together with her name on the first edition. So those are the two main sources for the music itself we have. We have, at the moment, we have an incomplete manuscript and we have a first edition. Uh, so are they accurate? Do they represent everything that Beethoven could have possibly written down to give us information about how to play it. That's what, when we're faced with uh, sources like this, we have to evaluate them and see, see how good they are. Are they accurate? Are, are the misprints? How does that all work? Um, if you notice, just as a little bit of a, a fun thing, on the that title page, the first edition title page, it says for per il clavicembalo. Now, that's kind of weird, although at this point there were still sonatas being published, again, to, to make money, to, 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 to give it a bigger market for the harpsichord. So this was published that you could play it on the harpsichord and or the forte piano, the, the pianoforte. Now, I can't imagine in my wildest dreams ever playing this piece on the harpsichord, although 
you know, harpsichords were still around, harpsichords were still being made in the 1790s. In fact, Broadwood, the great English piano maker, who I'll mention again later, um, was still making these big English harpsichords at the end of uh, the 18th century. So there were probably still harpsichords around, there were probably still old fuddy duddies around who were playing them. And maybe somebody even played um, this piece on the harpsichord. It's very, very possible, uh, although probably not musically the most satisfying way of doing it. But this is the last example in Beethoven's sonatas where we have the word harpsichord in the title page. So that's kind of, kind of uh, interesting. Um, so talking about, having talked about instruments, what pianos did Beethoven have? He didn't have the modern Steinway instruments. So what were his instruments and what were their characteristics and what can that tell us about, also about what was going on in these pieces? So before this, this sonata was written, Beethoven had a piano very similar to the one you can see on the left. Uh, that's a, a modern reproduction of a Stein instrument from, uh, actually that's, uh, I transposed the, the letters, the, the numbers were from 1786. Um, now Stein was a great, great maker from Germany, Augsburg. Mozart had a Stein instrument. They are wonderful instruments. As you can see, neither of the instruments you'll see there have what look like to us have pedals. But I'll come again, come to that later. The Stein instruments were um, slightly lighter uh, instruments than the one on the right, you can see. The soundboard was, was slightly thinner. They were not always strong. The stringing was not always um, three uh, strings to a note. Mostly the Steins were two, two strings per one note. Uh, that changed as things uh, got, uh, as, as pianos developed. Uh, so the, uh, the, when, Beethoven wrote the Moonlight Sonata, he had a Volta instrument like the one you can see on the right, 1795, which was a little bit more sturdy, the sound wall was thicker, the sound was a little more um, full, although the basic sound of the instrument is quite pingy. I, I'm sure you've heard forte pianos. Uh, the decay is, is quite rapid. The modern piano has a really long sustain. It has an attack, but then the, the modern ideal of a piano is that, uh, that everything sounds equal, every register sounds like uh, every other, that the, the, the sound of the piano is even throughout its register, and that the sound is a, a sustained sound. Both of these instruments that you see there, they have a very pingy quality, that there's a, a rapid decay, and then it sustains, but at a much lower level. The Volta is a little bit more uh, full and sus sustained instrument than, than Stein. But these are the instruments that Beethoven knew and had at this point. These are both German Austrian instruments, Viennese instruments. Um, so these were the two pianos that uh, he would have known. However, in 1791, Haydn had been to England and came back with an English grand piano, which was the new exciting kind of Aston Martin or Jaguar that was uh, around at the time. And, and the English designer piano was very different from this. It was much sturdier, the sound was much fuller. The mechanism, the keyboard mechanism was actually very different. The whole damp way that the, the piano damped, the damping mechanism on the strings was completely different. You'll see the Viennese uh, mechanism in a little minute. So actually, let's, let's go back to the Volta piano, which is the, the piano that Beethoven had when he wrote this piece. Upstairs, uh, just about there, is the instrument you're about to, I'm about to see in a few little videos. This is the front end of the, the Volta piano. It's, a, it's a, a copy of the same instrument you just saw in the little picture. It's a copy of a 1795 Volta instrument, so the, the, the kind of instrument that Beethoven had. Um, it's a very beautiful instrument. It's uh, made by Gijs Wilderon from here in Amsterdam. So um, this gives you an idea of the sort of front end of the instrument, so you can have a look at it. And I'll talk over. So you can see it's, a, it's quite a, quite a uh, lovely looking thing. It's quite uh, feminine in some ways. It's, 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 it's not very beefy. Uh, the, that bar you can see is, we'll come to that later. 
Um, so that's the sort of front end, the keyboard end, uh, the working end of the instrument. Um, the next little shot shows you where the pedals are. They are knee levers, they are underneath the instrument. Um, and I, this, this video will show you exactly where they are. They're, they're sort of hidden underneath the keyboard end. That's just below the keyboard, as you can see. There's a little lever there on the right, and there's a little lever there on the left. And here come my knees to show you how they are operated. Rather like that, just below the keyboard, and as you can see, there. And it takes a little while to get used to, to doing that. If you're, if, you know, if you're used to a modern piano where you press down, you've actually got to sort of move your knees up in order to operate these two things. So it's a very different idea. Before these knee levers were in place, so in the 1770s, uh, and some of the pianos into the early 1780s, um, there weren't even knee levers. And this is a very important thing to realize about early pianos and the whole sound world. In the early Stein instruments, rather than knee levers, there was a little brass pulley, pulley hitch, a, a knob which you pull in and out, just in the middle of the keyboard, uh, the, the, the lid, where, where, where the lid is now. And that was your pedal. And it was either on, literally either on or off, which is a very difficult thing for us to get our heads around as modern pianists, because that just is not the way the modern pedaling works at all. But that's just how it was. So if it, uh, this idea of the dampers and, and having an open, open ringing sound, when you've got this, knee, this, this lever here, it, 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 that was just the way they thought of the pedal. It was either on or off. The more so sophisticated square pianos, where uh, two levers at the left, was divided into the treble and bass halves, and you could operate the treble half and the bass half separately, but it was still either on or off. And of course, if you're playing, to turn the pedal on or off, you need a hand free. So that's an incredibly important thing to realize when, when one is playing music from the late 18th century on the piano. That was just how the pedals worked. And until these knee levers came, came in and then the, the, the foot pedals, um, that was how pedals were used. They were I literally either on or off. It's a very, very difficult thing for us to comprehend, but that's just how it was. And the idea of the piano being open, the pedal being on all the time, was just not something that worried them because it gave it a kind of full resonance. It could, it, it, because of the nature of the sound being so pingy, it didn't interfere as much as it would do if you stuck the pedal, the pedal down on a modern piano. Uh, the next two videos show you the two knee levers, the right and the left one. Um, is this, this is the, that's the knee lever, here's the, yeah. This is the right knee lever, which operates the dampers, you can see that bar, big, big, quite a big. Yeah, so you can see that, that bar, the bar with the dampers in goes, lies on the strings and is operated by the right pedal going up and down. And it's quite, it's quite a heavy, damping it, 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 and it's quite noisy it's very difficult the idea of half pedaling and gentle pedaling doesn't really work terribly well it, um, can you just show that one again Miles, just so you can so you can see that happening So the damping on these Viennese instruments with this big bar, damping bar, works very well. When the dampers are down on the strings, it's very dry. And when it's up, it's very, very wet. It's very, very black and white. The new English pianos, they had individual little tiny, tiny dampers over each note, each set of strings for each note. And they didn't really work in a, and for our minds, terribly well at all. That, that there's always a little halo of sound around the sound, around the sound of the instrument, which is very, very different thing 
from the Viennese music instruments, which you can see what the damping is really, it's really on, on or off. Um, the, the left lever operates what's called the moderator. And this is, uh, as you can see in front of the, the damping strings, this is a, a, a felt, sets of felt. Which This, in the, as you see, the, 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 the layer of felt that uh, goes in between the string and the hammer. So it really stops the attack. It makes it a very, very muffled, uh, very dramatic color change. It, it really sort of reduces the, the volume by a good 30 or 40 percent of the, the attack and the, the focus. And this was a very important part of the Viennese piano. Again, the new pianos that came in, the English pianos, and in fact the same with this, this playelch, is based on that English action. When you depress, when you would put the, the, the left lever or, or pedal down, rather than this moderator, what they now had was a, a real una corda, where the keyboard moves, you can't really see it, but the keyboard, when the left pedal is depressed, the keyboard moves to the right, so it's so the hammers are only engaging one or two strings. You can you can and on the English pianos you can really grade that from three strings right down to one string. So in the fourth concerto by Beethoven in the, in the slow movement, there's a section where there's some trilling going on, and Beethoven directs the sound to go from one string to two strings to three strings, and then back down through three to two one again. So that was a very important part of the new instruments that were coming in. Um, so the, the English piano was a, was a new and exciting thing. Beethoven had access to that, or had access, but he didn't have one. We'll come to, to that a little bit later. Um, so that the, the, the dampers being raised, the idea of, of being on or off is a really important one for, for the pianos and music at this time. And this application of the moderator, this real sort of soft, muted tone of the moderator was, was the other exquisite thing that the Viennese instruments had, which the English instruments didn't have, but they had the una corda. Um, so I'm going to play an example of, of the opening of the, the Moonlight Sonata played by a great colleague of mine, lovely, lovely um, a woman called Petra, who is a colleague of mine at the, the uh, Conservatory in Amsterdam. And this is just an example of, of someone playing, unlike Lola and Hauser, playing this music on um, an old piano. This is also a copy of, this, of the same instrument, the, the Valter from 1795. And she's playing this in a, in a concert. Just we listen to the word. And as you're listening to it, um, some things to listen out for. Look at, you can, the great thing about this damper rail is you can really see when it's going up and down. It's very obvious. Visually, it's very, very obvious. So as you're listening to this first minute or so, watch how Petra. Uh, uses the damper up and down, how often she changes it. So think about the, the tempo that she's taking um, and also the sound of it uh, uh, with, with the moderator on. It's not particularly noticeable in this performance, I must say. I don't know if that's just the moderator is not fully engaged, but that's something we can listen for. The other thing is listen to, we're all, we're all familiar with it, but... is mostly just a series of octaves and just notice the way she whether she plays them together or whether she does any arpeggiation or that kind of thing but particularly I'd like you to watch out for the, the way that the pedal is being used in this so here's a blast of the Moonlight Sonata being played on the right piano from a copy of the right piano from the from the time that this this music was written and the piano that Beethoven had and, and wrote this this music on
just, uh, I hope you could see this, she was changing the pedal quite a lot and sometimes she was trying to half change it and it's sort of, the, the damper slightly caught in the sound. That's the danger with these Viennese instruments with, the, with this damper rail. Uh, it's very hard to, to, to half pedal. It doesn't really do it because it just it slightly interferes with the sound. It doesn't, um, doesn't really work that way. Uh, and notice that she kept everything was together. All the octaves were together with the right hand. The right hand was never separated. So we'll come to that a little bit later. You might have known that the pitch was different as well. Um, another question about uh, uh, in, uh, instruments and, and music at this time is what pitch we should be playing this music at. Uh, I'm sure you, you know that modern pitch is around 440. Pitch has never been standard. It has never really been consistent. Um, so what do we know about pitch? We know that Stein's instruments were pitched at 421.8. How's that for being accurate? We have his tuning forks. So we know that Stein built his instruments to be played at that pitch. So when they were transported away from Augsburg, where they were built, to Vienna, what pitch would they be going to there? And that's a whole other can of worms, which might be the subject of the sessions at, at some other point. We do know that there were a couple of pitches around in Austria, and particularly in Vienna, there was something called Wiener Ton, Vienna pitch, which was a high, known as a high pitch, and it was actually more or less near 440. It was around 438, so just a little bit lower than modern pitch. There was also a Wiener Kammer Ton, which was a little bit lower than that, around 433, 45, something like that. Another standard pitch, as I've already mentioned, was 421 Augsburg. Uh, a lot of instruments that survive, wind instruments that survive, uh, particularly in the provinces, the more provincial Salzburg and around there, the, the pitch was around 420, 421. And this seems to be a pitch which was used quite a lot. London pitch, really, between the end of the, the 17th century and the beginning of the 18th century, actually all the way through to the 19th century, there was a pitch at 421. Handel's tuning forks were also at around 421 which were made, and these tuning forks were made by Purcell's trumpeters. How's that for a connection? So Purcell's trumpeters were making tuning, tuning forks um, at 421. And we know that Broadwood pitch, I've already mentioned Broadwood, the piano, English piano maker, Broadwood pitch at the beginning of the 19th century was also 421. That went up by 1830 to 423. And then after that pitch was rising rapidly. So what pitch do we play this music at? I, my piano upstairs is pitched at 421.8 or 422. So it's a sort of Viennese instrument tuned at a provincial Austrian pitch for, for, for all intents and purposes. So that's, a, that's just a, a choice that we have to make as performers. The fact that you might have heard of classical pitch being 430, um, there was very, very little real historical thought or application for that decision. It was sort of one of those decisions made around a coffee table uh, because somebody had to make a decision in the 70s about what pitch to do classical music at. Uh, and uh, 415 had already been decided as a sort of block, which, which again is a massive compromise. And it was sort of just decided to basically put it in between 415 and 440. So 430 seems like a good number. Um, that's really how that came about. Um, so 438 for Vienna and Prague and all the Habsburg um, countries and, and domain, that was the pitch, the Wiener Ton, that high pitch was, was generally what was being used in those centers. So probably the pitch that, that Beethoven had at this piano for this sonata was around 438. Let's see what the score says now. We've, we've had a look, uh, a look at these things. So let's have a look through the score. Um, there's some really fascinating in, in, in instructions here. Um, if you can see uh, at the top of the first page, well, let's, let's start at the very beginning in, in the words of Julie Andrews. Um, what sonata? Adagio sostenuto. In some editions, there's just adagio. Here it says adagio sostenuto with a C, a cut C, which means that the pulse is in two, two pulses a bar. So that's telling us something. Uh, 
there's a whole question about what does C mean, but the, the, the basic idea is that the pulse is in two. As you can see, the bass line moves in half notes. So that's the sort of basic slow pulse of the piece. Now this little Italian thing at the top is very, very important. Si deve suonare tutto questo pezzo delicatissamente e senza sordino. Now if you're a string player, if you saw the words senza sordino, you think, oh, I'm taking my mute off. Mute, sordino is the word for mute. You take your mute off, senza without mute. In fact, what this means in terms of the piano at this time is totally the opposite. The sordino was the damping bar, the damper rail. So what he's saying here is you should, um, this piece ought to be played with the utmost delicacy and without the dampers. So the, 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 that damper rail needs to be off, off the strings for the entire piece. That's what that direction says. And that's from Beethoven. Uh, we know that's from Beethoven, or even though we don't have that title page or the manuscript, that's from Beethoven, that is direction. Sempre pianissimo e senza sordino, again, as you can see in the middle of that first line, which is really fascinating. He's saying, always pianissimo and with the damper rails raised. Um, and as you can see, if you look through, there are very few uh, dynamic indications. There are a few little crescendos on this first page in the left hand on the third, fourth line. Uh, in the base, the base. If we go to the second page, at the end of the first page is a crescendo marking. If we go to the second page, again, there's a decrescendo at the beginning of that second page, small little hairpins, and then pretty much nothing. There's a decrescendo at the end of the third line, the pianist rose, pianist rose, a little crescendo at the bottom of that page, again to a piano, just so it's just a little up and then a piano. And the next page, also the last page, a few little swell signs. No arpeggiation marks, nothing to suggest that perhaps you should uh, arpeggiate anything or break an octave. So that's, that's the score as it stands from what we have. That's sort of the text, if you like, that first edition of the text. Now, what more can we find out? Is there anything more? Is that the whole story? What can we, uh, is there any additional stuff that can help us as a performer, perhaps know what Beethoven wanted. Well, there are a couple of people that can help us, one of whom you've come across with, with us um, playing the Beethoven symphonies, Carl Czerny. Um, and the other person I've already mentioned is Anton Schindler. These two people were incredibly close to Beethoven. Um, Carl Czerny was a great virtuoso. He was born in 1791, the year Mozart died. He was a child prodigy. He made his debut when he was seven. He made his first concert appearance in Vienna when he was nine. He started stu studying with Beethoven when he was 10 in 1801. So when this piece was written, the Moonlight Sonata was written, he had an amazing memory. He knew he was one of these, like Saint-Saëns, uh, he, he could memorize music immediately. He heard music and it all went in. He had the ability to retain all this music in his head. So he, he studied with Beethoven, was a great close friend and colleague of Beethoven. He premiered the Emperor Concerto. Um, so he, he was a great disciple of Beethoven. He, he, he was a, 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 um, important to Czerny that he uh, codified what Beethoven did in his piano music. Um, so that's Czerny's relationship to Beethoven. They were really, um, Czerny absorbed everything Beethoven did. He heard premieres of all of his music pretty much from 1801 onwards. Um, so it's so a great, great place to, to, to write about what Beethoven did in his music. Schindler, Anton Schindler is another very, very important um, person who came to Vienna in 1813. Uh, he was a lawyer, but also was a very fine violinist. Actually ended up playing first violin in some of the um, theatre orchestras in Vienna. Met Beethoven in 1814 and lived with Beethoven from 1822 with sort of his secretary, uh, 
and general helper, but again, was exposed to much of Beethoven's inner thoughts about performance and heard him playing his music. He gets a bit of a bad press as a, uh, from the musicological circuits because he, uh, in this very important book, Beethoven as I knew him, and he wrote his life of Beethoven as well, there's some facts which are a little bit dodgy, but there are very many in-depth musical explanations of how Beethoven played stuff. Really, really important explanations. So let's see what, what information you've got from Cherney. Here's Cherney writing about the Moonlight Sonata. Now, this is really fascinating stuff. Uh, if you remember, just remember what we saw in the uh, original edition. This is Cherney's, from Cherney's um, Opus 500 Piano Method, which is a huge piano method, which tells you everything you possibly could want to know about how to play the piano, starting with technical stuff and just read the music. But importantly, he, one of the parts, the third part of this piano school, piano method, is on the proper performance of Beethoven's music, piano music. And he goes through all of the piano literature, the solo piano music and the piano concertos, anything that has piano cello music. And it's a, an absolute gold mine of information. It's interesting from lots of points of view. Let's, so let's see what he says. So first of all, we have the music itself. What do we have here? Sonata in the closet. Look what we have. We have a, a, a metronome mark. Now that metronome mark is quarter note equals 54. Uh, people often criticize these metronome marks for being too fast. As we will see, that's not always the case. Some of them are actually much slower than we're used to. 54 is probably about the speed that Lola was playing. Um, Petra was playing, when she played, you heard the video of Petra, she was playing it at quarter note equals around 60. Now, it might not seem like a big difference, 54 to 60, but actually it is, it is quite, quite a big dif difference. Um, so we have a tempo, we have, we're excellent, we have a metronome mark which, which, we, which we can look at. See what else he says. He only says adagio, he doesn't say adagio sostenuto, but and there we go. There's always a discrepancy. Now this is very interesting. The allegro measure being indicated that the whole must be played in a moderate andante time. Adagio, andante, anyway, there we go. The prescribed pedal must be re-employed at each bass note, each note in the bass, which is not what Beethoven says in the first edition. He says you have to take the dampers off for the entire movement. So Czerny is saying something different from Beethoven. Uh, then uh, interesting musical things. In the fifth bar, the real melody starts. That's fine. Um, the semiquaver, there, this is an interesting one. The semiquaver must be struck after the last note of the triplet, as you can see, where the, the, P, the, the tune comes in, PPP. There's a whole school of, of playing, particularly Schubert, that when you have a a dotted rhythm against a triplet, you should play the, the dotted rhythm with the triplet. This is being very specific that the, the dotted rhythm should come after the triplet. There's some really interesting stuff here if you see uh, here when it starts. The, the bars 32 to 35, now this is really important, remarkably, which means you know, astonishing that you really notice it, crescendo and also accelerando up to forte. Now, if you remember when we were looking through the first edition, there's not a word of that, nothing, nothing to do with that in the score, that we, the, the, the first edition score, which in bars 36 to 39, again, decrease. Uh, in this forte, in this forte, so uh, going up to that forte, the shifting pedal, if you remember I talked about the shifting pedal, Cherny's writing in the 18, late 1830s here, by which time the, the, the shifting pedal was, was the norm, although he still had one later. The shifting pedal is also relinquished, which otherwise Beethoven was accustomed to employ throughout the whole piece. And he talks about highly poetical. And this is where we have a little bit of, of, of sort of the whole moonlight thing, which is a night scene in which the voice of a complaining spirit is heard at a distance. So that's fascinating for a number of reasons. He's saying that at that point, Beethoven, he relinquished the shifting pedal or the moderator. He got rid of the moderator. He made a big crescendo, remarkable crescendo and accelerando, 
for three bars, and then a diminuendo and presumably a de decelerando, decelerating back down to, which is not marked at all in the score. And he also says you should change the pedal with every bass note. Now that's very interesting. Now let's look at another example of this, this use of, of, of the, the pedal. Um, uh, the next image is, is from the, the, the Cherny talking about the third piano concerto. And here again, he, he's talking about the, the use of the pedal. Um, let me find my, my crib sheet. There we go. Uh, I think the crying baby's upstairs. They should be asleep. Um, so this is the Largo, the, 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 the slow movement from the, the third concerto, which is the most extraordinary slow movement, written in 1802, just a little bit later than this. And in fact, this is when Beethoven was writing this, we had a different piano, but we'll come to that in a minute. Um, Beethoven, who publicly played this concerto in 1803, continued the pedal during the entire theme, which on the weak sounding pianofortes of that day did very well, especially when the shifting pedal was also employed. This is now important, but now, as the instruments have acquired a much greater body of tone, we should advise that the dandel pedal be employed anew at each important change of harmony. So he's pretty much saying the same things he did about the Moonlight Sonata, you change with every bass with the, where the harmony changes, but in such a manner that the, no cessation of the sound may be observed. So he's saying something very similar. Now, if you look at the the, the metronome mark for this Largo, it's incredibly slow. 16th note equals 66. That's one second for a 16th note. It's uh, really slow. Nobody will dare to play it that slowly these days. Um, so just uh, let's have a look at the, the piano that Beethoven had by this time, whether he played this concerto on, on that piano, I'm not sure. This was an era piano, which is very, as you can see, there are pedals. Um, this is very like the English pianos. It's, the era piano was based on the English actions on the Broadwoods uh, that were, were coming out of, of England. So this may be the piano that, that Beethoven was using. Um, but to give you an idea of, of, of the sound, that, that, that this uh, sound world for this th third concerto, second, here's, here's a video of me, again, upstairs on the, the, the Volta piano playing the, the opening of this slow movement of the third concerto. Again, with the dampers raised for the entire time, even through the rests and the, the arpeggio chords which have dots on. So I'm just keeping the, the, the dampers raised and using the moderator for the entire opening phrase as, as Cherny says Beethoven did it on the pianos of his time. Go, second movement of Piano concerto number three. Again, the dampers completely lifted for the entire opening bars with the moderator employed as well. Both pedals now engaged. creates this incredibly sort of breathless special atmosphere when, the, when you, the, because the sound is in, uh, inter, uninterrupted as Jenny says it should be even if you change the pedal the sound should without cessation 
it's the most special atmosphere. It's the same kind of, exactly the same kind of atmosphere that is created by the way that you employ the pebbles in the opening of the Moonlight Sonata. Let's move on to Schindler, who talks about this very thing. Here's this book I mentioned about Schindler, Beethoven as I knew him, which is a wonderful read. Um, in this big first paragraph, he talk, he's talking about a review of the, the C sharp minor uh, sonata, and this is, which is quite interesting just from a sort of musical uh, point of view. It says the two movements, Quasio de Fantasia and Presto Agitato, are entirely appropriate to the awesome key of C sharp minor. I love the use of that word, which means slightly terrifying rather than awesome. Um, the composer indicates everywhere, insofar as such things can be expressed in conventional symbols, how the music is to be performed, how the piano is to be played in order to bring out the best qualities of the instrument. That's, so that's in itself. Then Schindler talks about it, what he just, just wrote. He said, I should like to mention in passing that the composer's direction that the whole first movement of the sonata quasi una fantasia should be played without the use of the damp pebble, senza sordine, is no longer valid because of the fuller tone of our present day instruments. That's basically what Cherny was hinting at. One thing you should remember, I'm going to try to sort of intimate, pianos were changing incredibly rapidly. The New England pianos were coming in. It was a bit like computer software or computers in 30 years about what computers were 30 years ago. It's a very similar idea as to what the changes that were happening in pianos. They were getting bigger, the sustain was getting more, and Schindler is confirming that idea here. He's saying that that's no longer valid for the modern, modern pianos. And in the next little quote from, from Schindler, he uh, says something similar and elaborates on, on that. Well, the next, next page up is, yeah. As we know, Beethoven noted at the beginning of the first movement of his Sonata C sharp, sempre senza sordini, that is the whole movement should be played with raised dampers. This was done with the knee. So he's saying it was done with the knee. So that implies that it was still being played on the Volta, not the Era, which you saw the later English style piano. The pedal was not yet then in existence. The desired sustaining of the notes in the simple melody, which was supposed to sound like horn, was not solved on the short term piano. Um, accomplished pianists in the second decade were disturbed by the Senza Sordini instruction because by that time the pianos could already produce a fuller tone and the performers had at their disposal the pedal, which they could use effectively. Cherny, however, who immediately began to exploit this improvement of the instrument, just as Chopin did later in his mazurkas said in the 1830s when the piano tone had been considerably increased that in the first movement of the sonata the pedal indicated is to be used again with each bass note. He's confirming that whole idea of journey having to change because the pianos had changed. So this is all really interesting stuff. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the as near as we can get about evidence about how things were being played at the beginning last first two decades of the 1800s. Is there more evidence we can have? Well, there's a wonderful piece of recorded evidence by a name that you may have heard, Arnold Dolmetsch. He was the beginning of the great Dolmetsch dynasty uh, of early musicians. Fascinating man. He was born in 1858 and lived till 1940. And the whole Dolmetsch dynasty carried on performing right into the 60s. Carl Dolmetsch was the Record player, the very famous record player in the 50s and 60s. Um, Dolmich was born in France but came and studied at the Royal College of Music in London in the 1890s uh, with Hubert Parry and others and became very interested in making old instruments. And in fact, put on a, I think I've mentioned this before in some of the talks, put on a performance of Dido and Aeneas in 1895 to, to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Purcell's death on old instruments, on completely on old instruments. That's in 1895. And he was very, he started making a lot of instruments. And in fact, he came to Boston and worked with the Chickering, um, Boston, Massachusetts, that is, with the Chickering Piano Factory, making pianos and, and learning, then went back to England. Um, he was also associated with William Morrison, that whole arts and crafts English um, 
thing that was going on at the end of the 19th century. But he was a very interesting player and was obviously exposed to lots of um, musicians that were around in the second half of the 19th century. And he made a recording of the first movie of the Moonlight Sonata, extraordinarily on um, a piano from 1799. And as he says proudly, using the instructions as laid out by the composer. So it's fascinating to hear this man born in the middle of the 19th century playing this music on, a, on the right piano, an original right piano from 1799, um, using this idea of the, the damper being completely raised. And I'm going to let it run for a little bit. If we were to, I remember I was talking a little bit about performance issues, about making arpeggios, not playing the bass notes, bass octaves together, maybe arpeggiating, not playing stuff together in the right hand. Just have a listen to, to I'll let this run for a couple of minutes of, the, of, of this recording of the Moonlight Sonata. <laughs> To, again, to, to modern pianists, they would never do this. They would never dream of breaking those octaves. But th th certainly, if you look at treatises, there are many treatises from the beginning of the 19th century which talk about exactly this, about breaking, making arpeggios. One, one treatise, for instance, has a, a list of 11 places that you can make an arpeggio. Uh, number 11 is where the composer marks it. And there are many examples of, of uh, in treatises from the 19th century about expressive use of desynchronizing uh, voices and making arpeggio to make more expressivity. So that's that's and it's fascinating to have that sort of confirmed by some someone playing playing like that from the middle of the 19th century. Um, and so it's really in line with that, that whole aesthetic. Uh, another example of, of of that is also a very famous Beethoven four piano concerto. Well, we have this first beautiful first chord. Uh, which again, modern pianists made massive pains to just voice that first chord perfectly with, without breaking it. In Czerny's Office 500, where he talks about this concerto, there's an arpeggio sign at the beginning of the concerto. Again. When that was first done, when Norin Tan first did that in the 80s, made an arpeggio on that, for, there was an outcry from many camps in, in reviews. Um, so having digested all that, what do we do? <laughs> well, I'm just going to, so now, using all that information, uh, I, I, I would love to play it live, but the, as you heard, the babies went to sleep about, hopefully they went to sleep about half an hour ago. 
So I didn't want to do it upstairs because that would wake them up. So I recorded a version of this, just giving you some little examples about how they're using, using the pedals. So you'll, you'll see me playing around with the moderator and the pedals at the beginning for a couple of times, and I'll give you a, a whole traversal through the opening movement of the Moonlight Sonata. And particularly remember that passage where Cherney said, get louder and faster. Beethoven got louder and faster, and took the moderator off and got slower and quieter for the, 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 the succeeding bars. So here's a, a little demo from upstairs earlier on um, with a possible version of the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata. So here's the beginning of the first movement of the Moonlight Sonata using a pedaling that um, most pianists, including Forte pianists, would probably use now, uh, if at all, um, by changing, as Cherry suggests in his method, changing the pedal, this is the right pedal here, on every bass note. This is how it sounds. And I won't use the moderator. So it's up. but it's just lumpy with the change changing the pedal just causes a sort of audible accent i'll add the moderator now or as Cherny says the shifting pedal by the time Cherny was talking uh, the the normal pedals were in operation the, the una corda which moved the which shifted the keyboard was in in, in use uh, beethoven did not have this on this instrument so this i'll put the moderator on which makes it super soft and i'll still change the the right pedal with every bass note still not very uh, spooky and peaceful. So now I will attempt to play the entire movement with both pedals engaged, the moderator and the uh, dampers raised for the whole movement and taking the moderator off where Cherny suggests that Beethoven lifted, uh, shifted the, the pedals um, and got very much faster and louder. So here goes, let's see what happens.
So here we are back in the kitchen. It creates an incredibly spooky atmosphere having that sort of mist of petal throughout the whole thing. Uh, so what, what can we, I mean, all this information is such interesting stuff and how it's this question of how you use that information and the tool that you're playing it on. But certainly uh, information like this little crescendo and diminuendo, I just had did a little spot check on YouTube before uh, speaking to you tonight. There's some uh, five or six very famous pianists from the last 40 years if any of them do that crescendo and accelerando and diminuendo and, and, and decelerando, virtually none of them do. So they either do nothing because it's not in the score. Some of them might do a little bit of crescendo, but not an accelerando. But virtually nobody accelerates. So it's just it's just fascinating that um, these are all very intelligent uh, pianists. So whether they've chosen to ignore that information, I don't know. But it's this is the kind of stuff that when one investigates this music one can come up with some, some shocking shocking uh, realizations about what perhaps was going on at the beginning of the 19th century so thank you for joining me on that i thought it was i hope it was a, an interesting expose of the way that our minds work in this hip world and i'd be very happy for any comments or questions from anybody that's still here so thank you for joining me on that i hope it was was fun Thank you, Richard. Um, yeah, so um, if uh, I, I know we're a bit over time, but if you have a quick question, um, you can feel free to pop it into the chat. If you're sharing your video, if you wanted to wave and uh, and and then uh, I can um, ask you to unmute your uh, your microphone um, so that we can uh, uh, so that you can ask it live. Um, Richard, it's 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 so fascinating to uh, to explore just a work that everyone has heard many times via. Uh, a concert or the elevator or hold music or whatever um, and uh, to, to, to really explore it from uh, um, you know and for us to hear it on on uh, on your beautiful instrument that you have upstairs um, uh, it's 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 it was just so fun um, and you know <laughs> All I could think about though was you moved a few months ago, and I can't. I can only imagine the uh, the all of the keyboards having to be to be moved up several flights of stairs. <laughs> that one, that um, one came in through the window. But yeah, it was uh, it was. I I had such fun. Um, and uh, let's see. Um, yeah. Um, just, just lots of compliments in the chat for you. Um, and, uh, um, thank you so much for, uh, for such another, um, intriguing sessions, um, exploring pieces that we think we know, but, uh, there is much to pick apart, um, and to, to, to further deepen our knowledge. So thank you for deepening our knowledge, Richard, today. Thank you, Miles, for all your, your fantastic work with all of the slides and stuff. Brilliant. Absolutely.